Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In this episode, I want to look at a recent, really recent, interesting article by Lindsay and colleagues looking, comparing nonlinear pedagogy and linear pedagogy approaches for weightlifting. This is a, a part of a series of studies these authors have done on using the same task. They're using the power clean movement in weightlifting. And they're looking at comparing these different approaches in, ver in various different ways. So it's a really important set of work. In the previous research, which I reviewed in my last book, right, the authors found that, so that basically this is part of their work and some of the recent work I've done, I think, is further evidence putting down, put against the need for fundamentals, right? Training basic movement patterns, decomposing, pulling out of context, and getting that first before you add more more complex situations, right? That's the idea, right? So we're questioning, why do we ever need to use a linear pedagogy approach where we prescribe a solution, we take it out of context, we use very low variability, we use strict repetition, so on, right? In their research, they found, previous research, they found people learn power clean, um, particularly in how keeping the bar close to the body um, during the lift, which is, is the basic kind of technique you want, equally well if they're prescribed a solution or if there was a set of constraints, right? So why prescribe it to them if they're gonna, if it's gonna emerge anyway, right? They're, it's gonna allow for more uh, functional variability if we let people uh, kind of explore and use constraints, okay? So that's the idea. Um, again, why would we ever wanna use a linear pedagogy approach? Uh, the previous research I talked about a few weeks ago Maybe we need it for people that have high variability or low coordination initially. So some less athletic, less skilled um, learners, maybe we need to start with a linear pedagogy approach. There wasn't really any evidence to support that at all uh, that I saw if you go back to that study. Let's look today at another kind of example, okay? So here's another kind of point against the fundamentals using a linear pedagogy approach, right? This is data from a study I reviewed a few weeks ago, the badminton, teaching the bad, bad, badminton serve, the simplexity. If you want to go back, have a look. This is the number of different clusters of movement solutions, right? Where a movement solution was defined, they had coaches look and kind of check mark how many different particular key technical, right? You were standing side on when you're serving, your feet were more than shoulder width apart. So they had key technical elements they were checking off, right? And, and, the clusters were based on how many of those you had when you actually served in the post-test, okay? The, the thing that they found, the, one of the key findings for me is, and the, I could show you other studies that find the same thing, right? Even when you prescribe someone a solution, right? In this study, in the <coughs> cluster two is the one, cluster three is the one, sorry, cluster three is the one that has all the key tele technical elements. It was the one people were prescribed during training in the linear group. What you can see here is that even in the linear group, that wasn't the most commonly used solution in the post-test, right? Um, people used all four clusters, right? Not as much as people in the non-linear group. They used all four clusters and used much higher, you know, a higher percentage of some of the different ones. But they, the linear pedagogy, the one they were taught is not even the most commonly one used, right? So the point here is, you know, this is, goes back to Franz Bosch, the body cares very little about what the coach has to say, right? Self-organization is a force of nature that's gonna happen whether we want it to or not, right? People are gonna use and develop different movement solutions, even if we try to tell them here, do it exactly this way, right? Um, so why bother trying is my point, right? Is kind of the point here. So, but let's go on to the, this new study. So this new study is looking at linear and nonlinear pedagogy for movement exploration and weightlifting. The key difference here is right tradition. There's a lot of studies that explore look at how much people search uh, when you, in the two approaches, right? Um, the idea, you know, the, one of the main prediction is right in a nonlinear pedagogy, we're allowing for more freedom of exploration of movement solutions. We should get more search, and there are studies that demonstrate. What they want to do in this paper and really add to this literature is look at both the quantity and quality of search, right? How much is all this extra search you're doing taking you towards your performance goal, right? Is tr moving towards this movement solution reducing the performance goal? Is this reducing it even more, right? 
So we're looking at both quantity and quality here. And they're, so they're going to, I'll talk about how they do that, right? Um, and they're going to kind of challenge the, the kind of assumption of ecological dynamics, right? That when you use a linear pedagogy approach, you prescribe a movement solution with, in very low variability task decomposed conditions, people don't develop functional movement variability, right? They don't learn to have adaptable movement solutions uh, that help them for performance goal, okay? That's the kind of assumption in ecological dynamics. So that's what we're gonna test. Okay, so this study actually used some of the old data from uh, previous experiments, but they had 19 participants. These were participants who were weight training on their own, but never had any formal training coaching, right? So they're gonna train to do a power clean, which uh, if you don't know, is taking a, a barbell and lifting it above your head all in one motion, right? The, um, the, and, they're, and they were randomly assigned to one of two groups, the linear pedagogy group or the nonlinear, which is exactly the same as what's used in, in previous studies. I'll tell you a little bit about it. So they're, they're gonna do training for four weeks. They have four week intervention, so relatively short, and we'll see that's gonna be an issue. What they're looking at here, right? When you do a power clean, you wanna keep the, the weight, the center of the weight close to, the, to the, your center of mass, right? When it gets way out in front of you, right? That's gonna cause a problem. You're losing, you're losing force. You're breaking the kinetic chain, but you're not transferring force effectively. You're not gonna be able to lift it much. You're gonna increase the chance of a back injury or knee injury or something. So we wanna decrease this horizontal displacement of this, of this, the bar from its center, the center of the mass of the, of the lifter, okay? So the performance measure is this distance times the length um, the length in the path, right? So they're measuring the cumulative distance from the center uh, uh, during the lift, right? So that's their performance measure. We want to get this as low as possible, right? Where you move the weight, keep it close to your body as you lift up, right? That's their, their performance. So it's interesting, you know, it'd be interesting, to, I don't know, I guess it's a challenge in weightlifting studies to do how much a person could lift, right? I, I would well, like love to see them in studies look at change in the maximum amount you can lift, right? Would be to an actual performance outcome instead of a, a form outcome, but that's it, clear. Okay. So in the nonlinear pedagogy, they use two kind of key task constraints. They did in in previous um, uh, research. One is putting chalk on your on your um, shorts, right, and telling you, giving the instruction, make sure you put chalk on the bar when you lift it. Obviously, that encourages you to keep it close to your body. The other is putting poles in front of you and telling you instructing you not to hit the poles as you lift the bar up. Again, uh, keeping the bar close to the, the, the bar. They use analogy-based instructions, no other technical instructions in the nonlinear pedagogy group. Just these cat task constraints, lift however you want. That's kind of, as I said, that is the same as used in previous research. Uh, in the linear pedagogy condition, they use uh, prescriptive instructions. They divided the lift into phase, six distinct phases, lifting, transition, turnover, and catch, right? Uh, they're very, very prescriptive, internally focused instructions. Place your feet hip, for example, for the start, place your feet hip width apart with toes out slightly bent over your feet. Squat down and hold the bar with a pronated grip and hands slightly wider than shoulder width apart, the arms fully. So there was a similar instruction to this for each of those six phases. I'm not gonna go through all of them, right? The coach, a coach observed, and when they identified an error, right, you didn't have feet hit with the part, for example, they would give you feedback. So corrective feedback, prescription, um, uh, it's kind of standard linear pedagogy approach, okay? Um, performance, as I mentioned, the main performance measure was this, this measure of the distance the bar was from the, the center of mass during the travel. That was the main measure of performance. We wanted to get that as low as possible, okay? In terms of other movement analysis, the first thing they did was look at, do kind of a coordination profile. They looked at a cluster analysis, looked at the time series of the lifts, and they looked at how many different clusters could they identify, a standard cluster analysis. If you don't know, the nice thing about a cluster analysis is it has no a priori beforehand assumptions about how many clusters there are or what they are, right? It just takes a data set and sees well, how, what's the minimum number of clusters I can break these data into to explain the variability, right? So it's a very kind of uh, open approach. It works very well, okay? Um, they're using, so they're using uh, cluster analysis. 
to look at exploration, I'm not going to go into detail about this. They're using something called a drifting Markov model. Basically, if you want details of this, uh, there's link, there's in the reference. I don't want to go to and I'll explain how this works, but it's measuring kind of the transition between different states, the transition between, that's what a, a Markov model does. It measures the transition between particular states, right? Um, I've used it before in some of my baseball work, like transitioning from uh, looking for a fastball to looking for a curveball, right? And it's measuring, in, a drifting Markov model is also looking at how the change between states is in, is related to the performance variable. In this case, the, the distance times length one, uh, how far away the barbell is from the body. So critically, they're looking at both the quantity, how many transitions do you make within the Markov model between uh, coordination solutions, and whether those transitions are functional, whether they're, they're serving to reduce the performance variable. Okay, So that's the basic design. Okay, let's look at the results. First of all, in terms of performance, okay, this is kind of an issue with this paper, right? This is the performance, this is the variable, here is across the sessions, the linear pedagogy group and the nonlinear pedagogy group. There's no diff group difference. More importantly, there's no change across the sessions, right? So this is makes everything else I'm going to say really kind of problematic and difficult to interpret because when we're comparing two different learning approaches, when you don't get any learning in the first place, right? There's no learning here. People didn't get better across sessions. What can you say, right? Um, it's probably you didn't have a long enough sessions or enough training in the session. So it very limits your ability to say much about training or learning when you get no training or learning in your study. But we'll take that as you know a, a major caveat of, of the conclusions of the study. Okay, so no, there was no learning. No one got any better in terms of this performance variable across the session. Probably four weeks was too short. Maybe they didn't do enough reps. Okay. Um, in terms of coordination and profiling, the cl cluster analysis revealed 13 different patterns, which is quite a lot compared to some of the other studies. There was no difference in the total number for each group. Okay. Uh, participant, again, they found, they did find in terms of the quantity of search, right? Um, there was less, uh, significantly lower exploratory behavior, right? Going between the different clusters, um, at, between, um, the different, uh, there was less for the linear pedagogy group than the non-linear pedagogy group. And this again is there, there was, the, there was, there were sessions had little effect on learning, right? So there was no benefit, there was no change in the performance variable across time. Okay, as I said before. If we look at, this is showing from the, the, the Markov models, right? Showing the emergence, the probability that these 13 different clusters are gonna emerge, right? So higher means more probability, right? So over trials, so you can see in the nonlinear pedagogy, right, kind of everything's coming out, right? All these lines are getting higher, right, are, are fairly high. These are two different versions of the, the same model. This is basically the what I'd like you to take about. You can see all the lines are fairly high, so people are trying lots of different things. In linear pedagogy, that's a, that's a little bit less, but critically, there's two ones that are emerging kind of more than others, right? So kind of what you would expect. Still some explanation, but two particular ones. This is very similar to the study I showed you at the, the start, the Badiman and serve, right? People are still exploring. The ones that you're trying to prescribe are coming out more than the other ones, but they're not limiting people from searching, okay? Even within, so this is their, even with linear pedagogy structure limit, participants exhibited meaningful adaptable behavior through minor movement adjustments. So they're they're making they're still showing this evidence of functional movement variability. Okay, um, they did find a significant a relationship between exploration and performance, even though there was a no change in performance overall, suggesting that the nonlinear and that this was just for the nonlinear group, suggesting that it's more functional in nature. Um, you know, so the search has good quantity, more quantity, and more quality in the nonlinear pedagogy group. Okay. So the author's main conclusion is these findings suggest that contrary to previous research, linear pedagogy do not necessarily deny learners the opportunity to exploit functional movement variability during the learning process. So maybe in ecological dynamics, we're overstating the point that prescriptive instruction, linear pedagogy task decomposition, uh, 
doesn't allow people to develop functional movement variability. It doesn't allow people to explore. Maybe we're overstating that case. Okay, I'll accept that, right? Uh, my interpretation, okay, may, as, as we are, as I said, so maybe we're overstating that case, right? Maybe when you prescribe exclusion, you're still getting some functional uh, exploration, self-organization. And like I said, other research suggests that. But overall, I still don't see why you would ever want to use linear pedagogy. I don't see why there ever is a reason, right? If we want people to develop functional movement variability, they develop more of it in a non-linear pedagogy approach, and it doesn't result in a difference in the performance, why would we want to restrict them from the start, right? In any way, right? I don't, again, I don't see why we, there's, I don't see the case for me, there's still no case for linear pedagogy. Maybe it's not as bad as we po pointed out to be, but there's no case for using it, right? Yes, it works. Like I've said before, I'm, we're not denying that traditional prescriptive coaching doesn't work. We're saying that nonlinear pedagogy is more efficient, right? They're more fit. We're getting people to search and explore more, uh, more developing more functional right from the start. If that's where we want them to be in the end, why don't we just go there right away, right? So again, from my conclusion, this study and the series of ones I, 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 I've reviewed, there's still no strong evidence for adopting a linear pedagogy for certain performers or starting with a linear pedagogy then switching to a nonlinear one. Why, right, why? I don't see why there's any benefit at all, but that's just one man's opinion, so. Um, well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining me. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.